Hello, and welcome to Insider Insights. I'm Emma Wegner, Associate Educator in Public Programs and Creative Practice at the Met. In this series, we're providing closer looks at objects from the collection and exhibitions with Met experts. We hope you'll continue to join us as we debut each new video. Today, we're joined by my colleagues from the Costume Institute, Assistant Curator Amanda Garfinkel, Collections Manager Elizabeth Randolph, and Conservator Glenn Peterson. Amanda, Liz, and Glenn are going to discuss nursing and Red Cross uniforms. Amanda will begin by presenting two garments that will be included in the Costume Institute's upcoming exhibition, About Time, Fashion and Duration, which will be on view at the Met from October 29th through February 7th. Next, Liz will discuss the history and design of women's service uniforms during the two world wars. Finally, Glenn will discuss the conservation treatment of a 1918 Red Cross uniform featured in the About Time exhibition. Thank you all so much for joining us today. I'm going to hand the presentation over to Amanda, who will get us started. I am Amanda Garfinkel, Assistant Curator of Contemporary Fashion at the Costume Institute. In the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, the Costume Institute and the museum would like to honor the service of healthcare workers and first responders with a virtual look at the nursing and Red Cross uniforms in our permanent collection. The archive is focused on women's uniforms designed and produced by fashion designers, tailors, and dressmakers. The image on the left by photographer Erwin Blumenfeld titled, Do Your Part for the Red Cross, appeared on the cover of Vogue magazine in 1945, the final year of World War II. One of many magazine covers and editorials advocating for the volunteer effort it reflects fashion's history of response in times of crisis. The Costume Institute's exhibition About Time, Fashion and Duration, which opens this October, will present a disrupted timeline of fashion history from 1870 to the present. We chose this Red Cross uniform from World War I to represent the fashions of the 1910s in the exhibition. At the time, women who volunteered for the Red Cross either purchased their uniforms ready-made at department stores or had them custom-made, like this example from Bergdorf Goodman. Made two months before Armistice Day, November 11, 1918, its hip-length jacket belted at the waistline and ankle-length A-line skirt follow the general lines and proportions of the wartime silhouette. The silver dome buttons and belt buckle are fashionable interpretations of regulation military hardware yet the Red Cross insignia at the lapel and the sleeve signify the wearer's rank and dedication to the war effort. The uniform is paired in the About Time exhibition with this ensemble by John Galliano from his spring-summer 2020 collection from Maison Margiela. The collection, which opened with this deconstructed nurse's uniform, honored civilian contributions during World War I and World War II. Galliano presented the collection as a message of remembrance a tribute to those who devoted themselves to the war efforts and a call to service in the present. Along with 59 other pairings connecting garments from different time periods, the 1918 Red Cross uniform will stand side by side with Galliano's 2020 tribute in the exhibition. In addition to inspiring designers like Galliano, uniforms are also influenced by fashion and for this reason, find representation in the Costume Institute's collection. My colleague, Elizabeth Randolph, Collections Manager, will now lead you on a tour of uniforms in our collection. Conservator Glenn Peterson will then explain the treatment process involved in preparing the 1918 uniform for exhibition display. Thank you, Amanda. The Costume Institute has a limited selection of women's uniforms in the collection, many of which directly align with contemporary fashions. Any woman who earned the right to wear a uniform during both the First and Second World Wars wore them with pride. And for many, it was their first entry into the workforce and a symbol of commitment to their country. The first several slides share some women's uniforms from World War I, starting with this outdoor service uniform on the left, which is very similar to the Army nurse uniform on the right. Prior to 1917, volunteers were expected to wear the uniforms of their profession or their normal clothing. The American Red Cross introduced four optional uniforms in 1917. Our example was probably worn by an American Red Cross volunteer with a brimmed hat, tan leather gloves, and high rubber-heeled boots. 
During specific tasks, the Red Cross volunteers were expected to wear a type of apron that resembles this one on the left. It was called a workroom uniform during World War I and later a wash dress during World War II. This particular workroom uniform has a non-standard shield patch on the headdress, which was presumably used to indicate a specific branch or location of service. It would have been worn during the production of much needed supplies, such as bandages, as seen in the image on the top right, or it would have been worn performing canteen work. Canteens were refreshment stations and restaurants set up at important railroad junctions during the war. The second headscarf near the middle of the page is a standard veil and coif style worn during World War I. It can be seen in both images on the right and it would have been pinned behind the head. There were women's motor corps throughout the country that filled in while men at the war front were away. The original uniform was a long coat length dress with knee breeches underneath to allow for mobility. Although originally embraced by some motor corps branches and the American Red Cross, it was quickly updated to include a skirt that buttoned up the front for propriety, as seen in both of these examples. This uniform on the left is very indicative of a motor corps uniform of the time with pockets on the bust and bellows pockets on the hips. It also has the original leather leggings to protect the lower legs. The uniform on the right was worn by a female mechanic and included the knee breeches for comfort while working on vehicles. Although women may have originally volunteered for war work, the majority of the roles and needs of their community extended well beyond the war years, and in this case, included wearing face masks to prevent the spread of virus during the 1918 flu pandemic. Volunteerism between the wars dwindled for the Red Cross, but by the late 1930s, it became apparent that the world would again be at war. Many Americans sought ways to provide support and the American Red Cross, as well as other volunteer organizations began to refresh and reinvigorate their work. This uniform on the left is the updated wash dress that would have been worn during roll call work, a form of public fundraising. This is also an example of the color coding system adopted during World War I to identify service corps members by sight. The navy blue collar, cuffs, and veil indicated a roll call or production volunteer. By World War II, each uniform came with specific guidelines for wearing, including rules for gloves, handbags, stockings, shoes, and even what makeup was allowed when representing the organization. Several specific roles within the American Red Cross also continue to grow and develop. On the left is a gray lady uniform, which would have been worn with detachable white collar and cuffs, as well as the veil you will see on the next slide. During World War I, this position was part of the Hostess, Hospital Service, and Recreation Corps but because their assigned color was gray, it developed into the Gray Lady moniker. They provided support in hospitals for the patients and staff. The center uniform is a refreshed motor corps uniform. The updated version was a dress that buttoned up the front and an overseas cap. For outdoor canteen work, it became apparent that skirts were not sufficient for cold weather and instead trousers were introduced. This ensemble on the right was designed by American Red Cross volunteer, Lita Brown, who later donated it to the Met. The design quickly became the normal uniform for working the club mobile, which provided donuts, cookies, and coffee to the soldiers. During the war, it was very fashionable to be in uniform, and fashion magazines even described the uniforms of each possible volunteer organization and military branch to help the readers select who they might want to give their time. For example, this page from Vogue magazine tells the reader to wear their uniform's headwear proudly. Within the collection, many of these hats and caps are represented, which shows how they were valued pieces of a woman's wardrobe during the war years. This leads to how fashion designers contributed to the war effort by offering their expertise. We have a few, exa few examples in the collection to share. Bonnie Cashin, at that time, was an emerging women's sportswear designer. She believed in comfortable knits, cuts, and designs. She would later be known for her work with Coach and use of metal hardware and leather trims. During the war, she designed comfortable uniforms for civil defense. These two examples were options put forth for volunteer work in New York City under the guidance of Mayor Fiorello Enrico LaGuardia. The American Red Cross saw a need to update their uniforms in 1941, and they looked to Elizabeth Hawes. Hawes was a well-established New York City-based designer who advocated for clothing that was desired rather than what was prescribed by the fashion industry, which she wrote about in her 1938 book, Fashion is Spinach. The uniform she designed was the standard outdoor service uniform. The suit included a front closure that could be worn buttoned up to the neck for warmth or a few buttons down to create a small lapel. 
The suit also included bellows pockets on the jacket, which mimicked styles from World War I. The ensemble was then rounded out with a toque style hat and an overcoat with a removable red fleece lining attached by a zipper. The lining even has knit cuffs to prevent a breeze from going up the sleeves when it was being worn. During the war, the need to save essential supplies was critical, which led to the bellows pockets being removed from the uniform. They were replaced by simple pocket flaps that gave the illusion of a pocket. This change can be seen in the image on the left. The same was true of the summer uniform, which can be seen on the right. This was slightly different with larger notch lapels and a lower center front closure. It is minimally lined and as lightweight as possible for comfort in warmer climates. The top center image shows the summer uniform as worn in Hawaii by the grandmother of one of my colleagues. An important factor for volunteering in many organizations during this time was that you were expected to supply your own uniform. You could purchase it from retailers, special order it, or even sew it yourself. The pattern shown here included both the summer and winter uniforms for the adept home sewer. Maine Rousseau Bacher, with his fashion label Man Boucher, was a well-known American designer who primarily worked out of Paris prior to the war. During the war years, he returned to the U.S. and offered his services to the U.S. Navy. The uniform he designed was for the Waves branch of the U.S. Women's Naval Reserve. This was a new position, and the uniform was a directly feminine reflection of those being worn by the men in the Navy at the time. The design was highly publicized and later led to Maine Rousseau Bacher receiving a meritorious public service citation from the Navy in 1960. The overall silhouette was fitted and chic, suited to the Parisian sense of the designer himself. Our images here are by photographer Nicholas Allen Cope for the About Time Fashion and Duration Exhibition Catalog that was recently released. The U.S. Cadet Nurse Corps was created in 1943 to teach young women to be nurses and fill the need for more trained care professionals. The launch included a snappy and distinct uniform designed by Molly Parnas and a flattering beret designed by Sally Victor. Parnas and Victor were both New York City-based designers with well-established fashion brands and storefronts in Manhattan. This ensemble is different than the previous suit designs in that instead of having seams over the bust, it has bust darts coming from the shoulder seams and a waist dart coming from the hem that would have been flattering for many figures and enhance the wearer's silhouette. The red accents on the epaulets and insignias make these uniforms stand out and are just as instantly recognizable as the Red Cross. This was a rare example of a uniform being displayed on the cover of a fashion magazine, truly connecting uniforms and public service to contemporary fashion. These have only been a selection of designers. Some others of note include Vera Maxwell, Hattie Carnegie, Lily Dashe, William Bloom, and Helen Cookman. Volunteer service was integral during both wars, which is directly reflected in the uniforms in the Costume Institute collection. They were worn as fashion and represented the honor of serving. This last image shows women in their uniforms from World War I on the left through the early years of World War II on the right. I'm now going to pass the presentation on to Glenn, who will share some details about one of our featured World War I uniforms. Thank you, Liz. Now let's look at our American Red Cross winter uniform in a little more detail. This uniform was worn by Frances Mortimer Townsend, Mrs. Samuel Riker, and you see her picture here in a different Red Cross uniform from around the same time. Both Mrs. Riker and her husband were from prominent New York families. Samuel Riker was a lawyer in New York City, and Mrs. Riker would have been about 45 years old at this time, with three daughters and a son, ranging in age from 8 to 20. This shows you basically how the uniform is stored. Our collection staff prepares objects very carefully for storage, and the white squares that you see are pieces of Tyvek, which is a non-woven polyethylene, and it's put in to isolate the metal buttons from the fabric parts of the garment, and also the metal buckle would be wrapped in Tyvek for storage. You can see on the skirt where some of the Tyvek has been taken away around the decorative buttons and flaps on the pockets, which are also a decorative and non-functional feature. As Amanda mentioned before, this is a custom-made garment from Bergdorf Goodman. And I'm showing you a label here, which is from 
the summer uniform of Mrs. Riker, which we also have in the collection, which is basically identical except for a lighter weight fabric. Bergdorf Goodman was a high-end women's tailor. They had recently moved uptown from 34th Street to 5th Avenue and expanded to a full range of clothing. And you see an advertisement here with a fashionable suit in a very similar silhouette to the uniform. And I also show you an example of another Red Cross uniform. This is Clara Noyes, who was a very prominent nurse at the time. And you'll see on her suit, she has a very fashionable crisscross belt and scoop shaped pockets. Uniforms are generally fairly sturdy garments. So we would expect them to be in generally good condition if they hadn't been damaged from very heavy wear. But we do find some damages on them. And in this case, one of those places with, was with the trim and the insignia. The picture on the left is an earlier picture that we had in our files. And it has a Red Cross emblem pinned onto the right sleeve. And we needed to determine if this was the correct placement. In my research, I wasn't able to find any other examples of exactly the same uniform, but we were able to tell from our records and from evidence of stitching on the garment that this cross actually belongs on the hat of the uniform. We also see here some damages to the braid that trims the collar. And this is a metallic braid that's stitched on with silk thread. Over time, the silk becomes weakened and uh, from rubbing against the rough texture of the metal braid, it will often break loose. So that was the case here that almost all the braid edging the collar was detaching and needed to be sewed back on. And you see that in the lower picture. And similarly, the metallic bars trimming the left sleeve of the jacket also needed to be restitched in place. But the more serious damage to this garment is seen in the lining. You'll see that there's quite a bit of staining and large losses to the lining. And this is caused by perspiration, which would have been invisible when the garment was in use. But over time, it causes the silk to yellow and age and become very brittle and fragile. And the losses are, are a result of that. And there's also evidence here of insect damage, which I believe is silverfish, which were attracted to the soiled silk. This is a detail from the inside showing you the areas of damage at the back neck and the bust and underarms. And the way that we would normally treat this is to overlay the fabric on the surface and to apply a backing in the areas of loss. And in this case, we needed to remove the lining in order to do this treatment. Often when we're preparing objects for exhibition, we'll do the treatment in stages. So in this case, we did the external repairs to the jacket to prepare it for photography. We took out the lining so it wouldn't be damaged when we dressed the garment on a mannequin for the photography. And then afterwards, when we had more time, the treatment was done on the lining and it was reinstalled in the jacket. I didn't have a good picture of the jacket with the lining taken out. But this is a diagram of the pieces of the lining, which is cut basically in the same way as the coat with a single front panel that's shaped with a vertical dart and the back in two panels. And the dark purple section are the sections that needed to be backed to support the areas of loss. Here you see the coat after the treatment where the lining has been entirely covered with sheer silk and the areas of loss in the upper half backed with uh, cream colored silk. And a closer view of the treated areas. We typically use this treatment of a sheer overlay 
because it allows researchers in the future to see the original lining while also protecting it and helping to prevent further damage and loss. So here's, you see the coat in its finished condition and also its catalog photograph. In conclusion, the image of the nurse and the Red Cross are particularly potent and immediately recognizable symbols of service and of the critical role played by our healthcare workers. We hope you have enjoyed this glimpse into the Costume Institute as a tribute to the tradition of care and dedication that continues to this day.